Hola, mi gente bella. Hello, beautiful people. I am so, so excited to be here today. One of the most amazing, loving humans that I have met, and I met her through my school, through my work, um, has said yes. And so we're here to connect to her story, to her work. So please open your hearts for Maricela Rosales. Hola, Maricela. <laughs> Hola. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm so glad you're here that we made it. Me too. It's been a long time since we've connected, right? Oh, I know. Yeah. Before we get down to it, because, you know, we're going to go deep, I'm sure. Uh, I want to read her bio because I was saying that although the bio is always included, I think it's important to know where somebody's coming from, right? Because everybody's talking the talk and it's important to understand also the history of the person, at least a little bit, because we're more than our, than the que nuestra biografía. Maricela Rosales is a Latina psychotherapist, somatic coach, Reiki master teacher, and perinatal expert based in Los Angeles, California. She supports women of color in reconnecting to themselves, the wisdom of their bodies, and their inherent wisdom through mind, body, and energetic work. Me encanta. Maricela, did you always know that you wanted to be a psychotherapist? Was anybody else in your family a psychotherapist? Or you, were, you the, were you the one to bring this? I want to know that story. Yeah, no, I'm the only one. And I don't think I knew I wanted to be a therapist, but I was always, always curious about people. And I can think of even when I was very little, I liked, I liked watching people. I mean, I still do. I think like people watching is so fun. But I was just curious about how people were. And just observing, like, why is that mom different than my mom? And like trying to figure out as a little kid, trying to figure out like, what was it? Was it like, I think when you're five, you're thinking maybe hair color or you're right. You're looking at these external things. But I was always very curious just about people and these big ideas of like, why are people thinking different things, right? Like, why do people think different things? Why do people be the way they are? And then as I started getting more curious, then it turned into like, why does somebody's brain turn to like depression or delusions or like these bigger things, right? So there was always a curiosity there, but I'm the only person in my family who is a therapist and who's interested in mental health. So I'm like the different one. I love that so much. I am very curious about human nature as well and why people do what they do. I love that so much. I think that it's inherent in a healer, right? To observe, to listen deeply. Um, so what did it happen in college? Like, were you like, mm, what should I do when I go to school? Or did were you in another major and then suddenly you went into this? Or how did that work out? No, and I don't. Honestly, I don't even remember how or where the idea of psychology got planted, probably somewhere in high school. So I knew that if I went to college, that I wanted to study psychology. And I didn't know what it would look like. I mean, it took me forever. I should have like three PhDs in the time it took me to get my bachelor's and master's. But I did go only only one major. So did get my um bachelor's in psychology, and then went to work in mental health as a case manager. And from there was mentored by some of the therapists and the directors and managers. And our executive director of the agency really encouraged me to apply to grad school. And they were all social workers. So of course, they encouraged me to get my master's in social work. And that's what I did. And then straight out of there became a therapist. I love that so much. So it's really from the curiosity to the interest to discovering it. And how was your spiritual? Porque hablamos mucho de lo espiritual here, right? We talk a lot about our spiritual path. Was that something early on? Was it something that took time? Like, you know, everybody's story is different. How did that unfold? There was no spirituality. Um, I think like a lot of Latinos, we grew up, we say we're Catholic, but we're not practicing right we were baptized did the first communion and that I can think of we would go to church only for baptisms the quinceanera <laughs> the wedding <laughs> right. cultural Catholic. you know like in Europe, there's a lot of cultural Jews right Jewish people yeah. there's cultural Catholics yeah absolutely and I think 
you know, to be honest, and this is probably the first time I'm going to say it out loud outside of like in my own little like healing space. Um, I lost my belief in God when I was very young because I would pray often to wake up in a different home or with a different family. And those answers were never prayer. Those prayers are never answered. Right. And so eventually it just became like, this is not a thing. Like, who am I praying to? These things are not happening. And, and it just came from not really having religion and that faith be a part of, of our family. It, like you said, it was just like a cultural thing. You're just going for the baptism or Easter Sunday. So there really was no faith in religion or spirituality. It wasn't until, and I'm trying to think probably shortly before the pandemic, because these, these past few years, like a few years before the pandemic, and then these last four years has been the transformation for me. And it was then that I just really started questioning everything. Um, My faith in mental health and everything I had learned And from there, it just kind of blew up in really questioning everything and really feeling like I needed something bigger than me to really anchor me down. And because I wasn't connected to the church, it was just trying to figure out like where, how, how do I figure out my roots and what that could be, right? I love that. I love that. And, you know, I really believe, you know, from an astrological and spiritual perspective, that the events had happened. I mean, it had many layers and many meanings and many reasons, but it was really overwhelming me for a whole huge group amount of people to wake up, right? They're home. Or, I mean, I was already home. So for me, the impact wasn't as great as it was for other people. I mean, I was already working from home so many years. The, the impact for me was like not being able to go to improv or go out, but I was already working from home for so many who lost their jobs or were working from home or had to do the transition to start working online. Um, their free time was spent in classes and training and healing and therapy in yoga and breath and breath work. Um, I love it that that was, and was it something, was it just like a process of asking yourself or was it like, was it there anything like an experience that happened, uh, anything like that, you know? I think little by little, just things just felt heavy and didn't make sense. And I, I, now looking back, I think I was burning out, even though it was, I had already left my full-time job and was doing private practice on my own. I was still connected to several agencies. um, So it was, there was some contract work on top of that. I was working a lot and I think I was just burning out. I was no longer satisfied with what I was doing and that made me start questioning things. And so what I didn't realize then is that pieces of me that needed to be healed were getting triggered with some of the clients I was seeing and some of the work I was doing. And of course, back then, I didn't quite realize that. I can see it now. And so little by little, I just had to, like, it didn't make sense to me. But it was like, I don't want to hold space for a pregnancy loss support group anymore. And I had been doing that for a while. And so I just couldn't make sense of it. But it was like, I have to let it go. And so close that a few months before the pandemic hit. I didn't realize I needed to heal my own birth traumas. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like that little by little, just things that were just not making sense, but it just felt like this is heavy. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. There was a lot of, I don't want to do this. I remember that a lot of that. I remember that too. When we talked about it, that's powerful because I think as a Latina and as a therapist, you know, for me, a healer, for you, a therapist, we're taught like, well, no, we have to help everybody. Like everybody, like if you're doing something and it's helping people, you got to stay in it. Um, I remember when I realized that I really wanted to work with um, gifted teens and I felt guilty, right? Because I was like, well, shouldn't I work with people who need it more or this or that? But it's like, but that's who I want to work with, wherever they come from, right? Especially if they're coming from underserved areas. And I think when we release the guilt of the should, right, of the have to, and just say, I just don't want to do it anymore. And it's not bad or good. It's just that I don't want to do it. We give ourselves freedom. How did that feel like when you let go of that group? Did something else take its place? Nothing took its place. I got my time back. And I think that was slowly like 
me really thinking about how I was going to structure my days and my work so that it felt better for me. And again, still not having all these answers, but knowing I want to help people, but I don't want to give up. Even though it was once a month or twice a month, I don't want to give up my early Saturday morning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the women that were in the group didn't know that some of the things that they were saying were triggering me because I hadn't shared my own birth stories with them. I was holding space, but wasn't sharing some of my own stuff, right? So releasing that created space for me to be able to turn towards like, what do I need? Because this is feeling kind of, it's feeling painful. What do I need to heal within myself? What it turned into was I really did step away from my perinatal work, which is like my specialty. And I had to step away for a couple of years so I could tend to me. And then feeling like that stuff's taken care of. Now I can come back. And so that's where I'm even at right now. Like coming back to like, how do I start, you know, talking to and treat, you know, working with more pregnant and postpartum women now that there's more space for that. I love that so much. And I love that so much for you. And something that I always assumed when I was younger was that therapists had to do their own work to be therapists because the healer that I was exposed to had to do their own work before online, before all of this. But what I've come to realize is because they're so busy getting through school and working and doing all the things, they might do a little work, but then they're like pushing through. And then at some point they realize this. Do you feel like you've met other therapists who are also reaching a point in their career at some point where they're like, I don't want to do this and I need to take care of myself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's where you start seeing a lot of, and it's probably for any industry, right? Where you start seeing people switch from like they're a doula and now they're do like now they're a coach or they're a therapist. A lot of therapists are becoming coaches or are going into like healer work practicing Reiki, doing that sort of thing. I think part of it is that we do, we do burn out and you're right. If there's no time to take care of our own traumas, our own stuff, at some point we have to pause because you, you can't hold everybody else's pain and then you're getting triggered. Right. And so I think it's that burnout and also realizing like there's got to, I think it's also realizing there's other ways to help people heal. It's not just the traditional therapy that we learn in grad school. And I think that's what creates these shifts into like, ah, so there's like, there's Reiki and I can use that to help clients too. So I think that's that beautiful shifting and evolving as well. I love, I love that so much because personally for me, like my experience with therapists, I walked into my first experiences in my twenties when I had healthcare and I had done a lot of research. So I was like, I need you to use the tools you have like first meeting. And what I notice about people who tell me about they're going to a therapist is that they don't know anything. So they put their hands in the hands of the therapist Mm-hmm. And the therapist just listens to them for years or whatever. And then they come to me and then we do hypnosis or something and they have a breakthrough. And one of the things that I always do when I work with a therapist is get somebody who does EMDR because I know, you know, it works for me. I tried it. I work with somebody who does hip- hypnosis, but I'm like, don't wait three years to do it. Yeah. Like I'm balanced. I'm good. I'm taking care of myself. Yeah. And so sometimes I, I wish that maybe the training, because I don't know, I haven't gone through it and I've thought about it so many times. And then I see half of my clients are therapists who are wanting to leave it. And then I'm like, yeah, don't do it now, girl. You know, the time is now. <laughs> just do it. But one of the things is like that we, that maybe the traditional way of just listening, listening, although it's great and it helps because we hear ourselves, somebody's reflecting back, we're being held in safe space, maybe heard and seen for the first time that there's other ways of doing things too. Or, or in addition to, right? But you bring up a good point. Point. If you've never had the space to share your story, to out loud say whatever's going on, and no one's ever listened to you and and said it's okay to say that or feel that, it's going to feel really good. And we all need that, but it can't only be that. So if it's just talk therapy and you're just coming in to vent or talk about how your week is going, you're not doing any. That that's not real work. And I, I met with um, a doula I know from my community a few months ago. And I remember she said, um, 
I don't remember exactly the whole sentence, but she called me a non-traditional therapist. And I, when I first heard it, I was like, oof, what is she thinking? Like, I was ready when she got there for a cafecito to be like, okay, ask me any questions you want because you said this and I want to clear it up. And what she meant was that her experience and the mom she works with is that people go to therapy and all they do is vent and there's no connection from one session to the next. And then they're there for months or years and zero changes happening. And what she meant when she called me non-traditional was you don't do that. But I was taking it like, what is she think I'm doing, right? And I had to explain to her, I said, therapy, every therapist doesn't do that. We do have interventions. We do have things that we're doing. But yes, there are some therapists who will just let you come in and vent and talk about what you did at the Carrasada over the weekend, right? There's no movement. It's like you're just that's why somebody to so exhausted, honestly, because I've worked with yeah. tons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they're like, but aren't you tired? Don't you do eight to 10 sessions? Sometimes I, do, I have done eight to 10 sessions a day in the past, like especially if they're two 30 minute a hour, a 90 minute hypnosis session. I could do sessions for 10, 11 hours. But I was like, well, but in general, people want to be there. There's hypnosis for anxiety. So there's like a goal. Mm -hmm. And most people write me, they're like, yay, I got over my fear and I was able to do public speaking. So I go, it's a different situation. And I always tell my clients to go to therapy, by the way. Every time they come to me, I'm like, well, we're going to have like a big breakthrough. And then who's going to hold you through like the weekly unfolding of the breakthrough into your life, mm -hmm. right? You know, when we go in retreats or we're in a class or something happens, sometimes we have all these breakthroughs, but then we go back to our regular life. And it's like, how do you take the magic of the realizations when you have to get up now at six in the morning, when you have to do this, when you have to go take the train or drive in traffic, or you have your husband or your kids. And that's where I think that I always recommend, I'm like, you need a therapist to be seen and heard, to unpack. You need a therapist to look at your childhood because a lot of us Latinas are pushed like, no, oh, you know, I made it through. I'm strong. It made me stronger. It still doesn't take away the fact that it was hard and we shouldn't have gone through it, right? It's like... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And strong doesn't mean we have to be tough and push our, our feelings away and, you know, all of that or don't feel. We're just operating just from the neck up, right? But yeah, absolutely. So things like EMDR or somatic therapy, which is what I do, um, like just using other ways to not just talk, but then actually get to the root of what's happening in the body, in your energy and, and integrating the mind with the body and the spirit so that it's not just staying stuck with that story or those thoughts that you're repeating over and over and over and over. Absolutely. I love it so much. And I love having you here because, you know, you're so calm, you're so grounded, you're so in flow. And I think that we need to see more women, more people, but especially more Latinas more people going through different changes in their life and choosing different, choosing themselves. You know what I mean? Because we're so used to like running to try to keep up and survive. My question for you that I love to ask, what ancestral patterns did you have to break in order to be yourself today? Oof. And I think you and I may have worked a little bit on this or came up in some of our training, um, that fear, right? That and I think not even knowing, even now, if I were to tell my mom, let's, you know, can, let's tell dad for us to use Reiki for his, you know, whatever. The response I immediately get, so anything outside of what they see is like, it's only this way. And I think that is a generational pattern that had to get broken so that I could feel comfortable even practicing Reiki for myself or connecting to the ancestors or creating an altar, all those little pieces that are now part of my spiritual practices and beliefs, right? Because it was the Catholic church and everything outside of that is el diablo or the brujas. And it's all bad, <laughs> right? Totally, it's really, it's, 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 it's been demonized, all the indigenous practices, the hands-on healing, which, you know, I was teaching my Reiki class, which I didn't learn, but, I was able to receive this wisdom on my own. My teacher didn't teach me that, you know, every indigenous culture, every indigenous place, every indigenous people have some form of natural healing, some form of, 
trans, dance, energetic healing. I mean, our mindfulness practices that are created today and all this breath work, I was doing breath work 30 years ago with an acting teacher who was ahead of her time and we did somatic work because she felt if we could be in touch with our mind, body and spirit, we'd be better performers, right? But she didn't call it that word, but it's what is being shown today. And so people are like, oh no, the mindfulness is so good. Uh, hello, Reiki helps you with mindfulness. Mm -hmm able to and what ancestral gift are you leaning into what ancestral gift are you leaning into in order to be who you are and do the work that you do in the world mm. I think what I have learned what has come through the women in in my family is plant medicine is one of the gifts even though it has taken so many different ways of getting info from mom but I have learned that my mom and my abuelas all worked with plants. And that is what they did to heal the kids and the family members. And I'm very drawn to herbalism, plants, um, and the energetic, the energetics of it, because that's what you're working with when you're working with plants. So it, to me, it connects. Like it started with Reiki, but then how it just evolved into other other pieces too, like plant medicine. I love that so much. Yeah. And do you have any special offerings that you're offering right now? And where can people find you? Like right now, I have distance Reiki and um, coaching, and then of course the therapy, holistic, somatic. It's all you know, all body based. No matter what I offer, it's about getting back into your body, your energy, right? Being more connected to the self. I love yeah. that. Message. Is is there any message on your heart that you would like to give our listeners today? Mm. Yes, to trust their bodies. Even if it feels like they're disconnected and it's too hard to feel, but even having that seed, that little idea of there's wisdom here in my body waiting to be communicated when I'm ready listen mm. whatever you need is within you have it you have yeah. it in your corazón in your body I love it Está todo dentro nuestro corazón. I love that so much Maricela and where can we find you on Instagram or on your website Instagram is at healing with Maricela with an S and my website is my name so Maricela Rosales.com Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, for sharing your awakening. And something that I think so many people can resonate to is like the fear, right? That we have to heal in order to fully be ourselves and embrace the gifts and intuition that we all have in our corazón. Thank you, Maricela. Muchas gracias. Follow her, work with her. She's amazing. Un abrazo grande. Bye. Thank you. Bye.